There we go. Okay. So thank you all for joining us. Sorry about the hiccup. Um, if you need closed captioning, you can simply click on the CC button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. My name is Lauren Wittick, and I am the communication specialist for Region 4, which is based out of the University of Utah's Eccles Health Sciences Library. Um, a few housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording today's session, and it will be shared out with attendees and registrants once it becomes available. It'll be on the V. Bears platform as well as the NNLM uh, YouTube channel. So go ahead and check that out in a, give it a couple weeks usually, and then it'll be uploaded there. We just ask that you please remain muted for the entire session. And finally, we ask that you enter your questions into the chat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of after all of the lightning talks. So just go ahead and enter them as you think of them and we'll get to them towards the end. So a little bit about Region 4, we are made up of nine states, including uh, Arizona, Idaho, Colorado, Montana, New Mexico, the Dakotas, Utah, and Wyoming. And we have three pillars that really guide our work, and they are community engagement, providing funding opportunities um, for outreach, technology improvements, and professional development, and then finally offering training and education programs. So if you'd like to stay up to date, this is a little plug for us for Region 4. If you'd like to stay up to date with Region 4, you're welcome to sign up for our weekly newsletter or check out our blog. And both of them are linked on our regional homepage, which is right there. It's nnlm.gov forward slash Region 4. And so I want to welcome our first guest speaker, Robin Levin. Robin is a Fort Washakie school slash community librarian and has been working among the Eastern Shoshone and no Northern Arapaho tribes since 1981. Her work has included many awards and recognition for the outreach to Wind River Indian Reservation patrons, young and old. Covering a remote Wyoming landscape requires Robin to drive to reach as many families as possible, promoting literacy and healthful life choices. So I'm gonna hand it over to Robin. Hey, um, thank you very much for letting me Greet everybody, welcome. And hopefully all the technical stuff is under control. Our program um, started because of COVID. I think a lot of the outreach programs around the country were inspired by the fact that, hey, by the way, we don't really reach everybody and COVID uh, made it clear that something needed to be done. So, uh, while the state of Wyoming was looking to create appropriate outreach, mostly electronic, with um, funding from COVID relief and so forth, the state librarian, Jamie Marcus, said we'd like to have the reservation included, even though we are not officially under the legal umbrella of the public library system. We're an adjunct or we like to call ourselves an outpost library. Um, and so in talking with the other specialists in their various fields, museum, health, educational, academic librarians, and uh, so forth, they didn't realize how remote we really are here on the reservation. And the, at the time, this was 2021, we, um, we could say that fewer than 50% of the families had internet. Oh, well, let's have hotspots and let's, you know, give out devices so that people could access the internet and have access to better health and better literature. And that's all well and good if you have a vehicle that runs that's available to you. And with multi-generational families living in one home, well, you know, a small two-bedroom home might have as many as 17 or 20 people living in it. That's common. The opportunity to avail oneself of these great technologies is limited. And I said, how about the old fashioned bookmobile idea, but instead of a lending library, because of COVID protocols and restrictions, how about if we just give books away and we'll go out to the community and we'll see if we can make that work. Schools were closed, libraries were closed, our school was closed for 18 months because of COVID. And no one was able to get to a library without extreme 
transportation issues. So that's how we started. And uh, in April of 21, our little minivan bookmobile was launched. And David Brown is with us today, along with John Bramble. And both of them can attest to the idea that there's a really cute video on the NNLM sources showing our bookmobile and what it looks like and how we get around and where we are. Do we want to see that film if it's available? If... Oh, there it is. Good. Right. That actually, that's the Snake River by the Tetons, just for a little geography there. David, can we show this? It's playing, but we're not hearing the sound. I'm not hearing or seeing any video. I'm just seeing a still image right here. Sorry, just need to push the play button. I did that. Ah, there it is, okay. No sound. Well, I'll tell you what, if we have no sound, shall I just talk over the movie? <laughs> sure, go for it. Well, there I am. <laughs> it's a little too much for Robin. Oh, there, oh, we have the closed caption, right. So here we are at the Ethody Health Clinic and desire is to see that literacy is an important part of everybody's home. And I think that brings us to the question of why are we part of this NNLM grant cycle? When we're a library, we're not a medical facility, but we hope to bridge that gap. Robin's submission was to support her Moby Bookmobile, which at the time didn't have much of a collection of health-related topics. And so through funding through our program, she was able to supplement her collection. And she now has a pretty robust collection of health related books that are culturally appropriate to the population that she serves. We selected titles that would address physical health, nutritional health, but also we wanted to make sure we had books that addressed emotional and mental health. Right off the bat, they would ask, do you guys have any native books? And they were the first ones to go all the time. For many, it might be their first time to actually read and identify with a book. The younger kids today are much better prepared to live in two worlds, if you will, you know, the Shoshone world, the culture, and the non-Indian world. Chief Washki was the leader of, uh, of the Shoshone tribe. And he said, I want my people to look at that paper that white men look at. That is the way that we're going to keep our land, our water. And he was talking about education. Thank you, David. That, that was the, a really nicely done little documentary. I thank the people involved in putting it together. And it tells the story very well, and it shows the story very well. 
So what we're continuing to do now is we continue to distribute books for free. And twice a week, we head out and display books. Now that we know we have an audience for health-related books, aside from the funding that we get from NNLM, we continue to purchase books that address those questions, specifically with Indian country in mind. It's really an honor to, to do this. So I'm very grateful. Uh, here are, here's our latest number. In total, up to the end of 2023, we have given away 9,951 books. So just over 10,000 books as of January. And I can't tell you how much the community appreciates it. They'll tell you, oh, we're, we look forward to you coming and thank you for the books and our kids read together and we read as a family at night and we would never do this before. So NNLM has been wonderful in helping us achieve that level of literacy and comfort in our community. And we're extremely happy and we're gonna keep going with it. So there we are. Thank you, Robin. So let me just share my screen. And just remember we'll have time for questions uh, at the end. So our next presenter is Fran Rice. Fran has worked in the healthcare industry with government agencies, major healthcare system and community organizations. It was the work in hospitals and observation of patients and families trying to obtain information to understand their medical situation that led her to be involved with the not-for-profit Children's Medical Library, which is now called Health Connect of South Dakota. As executive director for Health Connect, Fran provides outreach programs throughout the state and oversees the organization's operations. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Fran. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> um, like Robin, I am very grateful to the National Network of Libraries of Medicine and John um, for his mentorship and support in um, helping us at our location in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, obtain a, one of the outreach grants, the Engagement and Outreach um, Awards. We, um, the one I'm gonna start to talk about is the Healthy Sioux Empire, but then I'll go into our current one um, that we're working on with our community health worker. So Healthy Sioux Empire was really just um, getting the awareness of consumer public health libraries as a medical librarian myself having like, um, Lauren mentioned, worked in the corporate healthcare world, navigating, um, having patients navigate consumer health information was not something that was common in our community. Um, and so that's why in 1999, the Children's Medical Library was established because a family um, was denied access to health information um, concerning a diagnosis for one of their family members. And that happened to be a child. So they had family that lived in Phoenix, Arizona. And as those of you who have been around healthcare for a while know that many of the large cities had consumer public health libraries already established. And I believe the University of Utah had one as well. And so that was the model that we used here in Sioux Falls um, for our development of the Children's Medical Library. And as Lauren also mentioned, we changed our name in 2004 to Health Connect of South Dakota because adults adults did not think they could ask questions. They did not feel they could bring us um, information or any of their informational needs. And so that having the name Health Connect of South Dakota has embraced what we actually are, which is a consumer public health, or I, I say a medical library for consumers, because when I say consumer public health, that people roll their eyes and they don't understand what that is. They understand what medicine is. And so I use that term, um, but I am very much um, a person on the street, um, working with people coming in, in our um, current location. And so that's how Healthy Sioux Empires began. Um, we were working through multiple um, things in our community. 
And when I say Sioux Empire, we have um, four counties. We have a population here of over 300,000 people, which doesn't sound enormous, but compared to Robin's, um, you know, population that she's, you know, dealing with. And it's all, we have all sorts of um, ethnicity, ethnic groups and languages. Our school system has over 142 different languages spoken or um, dialects of languages. So it's a very large melting point, melting pot, this uh, the Sioux Empire. It encompasses four um, counties. And one of those counties is the largest growing in the, in the United States. But um, since we serve the whole state of South Dakota um, with the health services from Health Connect of South Dakota, I have, ex you know, background and worked with several of our reservation locations, um, including Pine Ridge, which has the lowest um, income in the nation. So it's very, our state is very um, broad and that's why just having, starting with Healthy Sioux Empire was a really important functionality for our grant. I'm, I'm just letting, I'm letting people in as they come through here, so just so you know. All right, let me go to the next slide here. So these are the four counties that we encompass. Um, Lincoln County is, like I said, one of the largest um, growing counties in the whole United States, uh, population-wise. So one of the things that we were finding is that people didn't know what the National Library of Medicine did. And that, to me, was very frustrating. So I did some learning um, segments, and I'm showing you one of the last slides from uh, the presentations. Every month, um, our Health Connect hosts our manages, I don't know what the word is you want to call it, John and David, you can throw a word out there. But um, we oversee a, the, a coalition called the Sioux Empire Coalition. And I found that the members in that coalition did not know anything really about the National Library of Medicine. And for me as a medical librarian, that was like, that was like blasphemy. <laughs> they, they needed to know about um, the National Library of Medicine. So we started by just talking about Medline Plus. And that being, you know, a resource, and we navigated through the different features of Medline Plus, and um, then we also looked at um, the resources that we have available in our consumer public health library. And you, um, I'm pretty sure in the slides, uh, like I told Lauren, I just grabbed a presentation from <laughs> from a disc. I have of all kinds of presentations, but I'm pretty sure our website will be at the end. If it's not, I'll put it in the chat box for you. Because we, we can loan materials throughout the, the um, anywhere. Um, we've had requests for information from Australia and England. Uh, we haven't loaned books there, but we have done research and helped people in those locations. So, And I don't know if the chat is for me. So, Lauren, I'll let you channel that for right now. Um, okay. So our next slide. So um, one, th one topic that we found, again, needed to be talked about, not just the National Library of Medicine, but what is health literacy? And, you know, how does that, um, how, can, how can we get that into conversations that are understandable? Um, and because we want people to be empowered. That's, that's the goal of um, medical librarianship for consumers, is to have the consumer as empowered as possible. So... Back in 1997, when this family had their ep episode or their incident with their doctor, um, there was many, many different fac uh, community facets that realized that we weren't reaching the consumers. The public library system wasn't um, or wellness. Um, nobody want wanted to talk about those topics. And so people were going to appointments or you know, or just making poor health information decisions um, because they weren't confident and they weren't empowered. And so that's where the Children's Medical Library and then the Health Connect, uh, Health Connect of South Dakota moved that forward and making making a collection available that um, can be used by all ages. So from from youth to seniors, because we want people to make better health decisions that will help our, our society. And our society here has a large homeless um, uh, component. We have many veterans um, that are homeless and, and um, in our community. 
And so we work with multiple um, community agencies to bring resources to them and um, make them, you know, feel empowered and get re answers to the questions. So one of the ways we did that, um, you know, I, I won't go over these, but is to apply for another National Library of Medicine um, grant. And that was to bring a commun community health worker onto our staff here at Health Connect of South Dakota. And we um, worked through that and starting in October, um, we have had our community health worker on board and uh, our biggest problem was hiring one because th there's a shortage of employ you know employees so that was that was um, interesting navigation but we successfully we have an amazing community health worker on board and um, she goes to the public libraries uh, our our main branch of our public library system excuse me. And um, right now we're just doing Saturdays and, it, you know, we're talking about a city entity that, um, so it took some uh, some time to negotiate that contract. There's a lot of people still wanting to come in here. I'm excited. Um, uh, so we got that contract squared away. And now um, she's been going for the past two months, um, November, the end of, no started in December and has had two visits this month. And each each time the visits have been exponentially growing. Um, she goes, she has a room that's um, set aside. We have a banner there that um, lets the people coming to the library know when um, the community health worker will be there. And there's a phone number, uh, a private phone number that they can use to reach her during the times when she's not physically at the library. So. That has just, it, it has um, really manifested into some amazing connections for people in our community that just need that hand up. They need to understand, you know, help with how do I get my that cell phone service? How do I get a house or, or home, you know, or apartment? Um, work with a lot of felons, looking for felon friendly housing, um, looking for health insurance. So it's pretty much all those social determinants of, of of health, um, she's covering with a variety of different guests, males, females, um, some Native Native Americans, um, not Native Americans. She's our community health worker is bilingual, so she can also help the Hispanic community as well. So in addition to our community health worker's success at the library, we also um, have engaged recently with our residency program here in, hi Wendy from Montana State, um, our residency program here it, located in Sioux Falls and they, tra they train family practice residents. And so, um, so some of the, the guests that are clients that she'll see at the Center for Family Medicine are also some of the people that would come to go to the public library for um, assistance. So. It's a work in progress. That part is a work in progress, um, but we're very, you know, we're excited about the progress that it's making because it's, it's like I said, exponentially growing. Um, so the other thing that we have been introducing the community to, or the Sioux Empire to, is the amazing traveling exhibits of the National Library of Medicine. So we are blessed um, to have been picked through the lottery process. Those of you who are have participated in that. So we we just been we've been blessed. And we're, what we're also blessed with is partnerships. So I'm very big on collaboration. Um, unfortunately that wasn't something I was able to do very smoothly in a corporate healthcare system. So I'm very glad to be out in a community-based organization where um, parameters that involve our just our workflow um, is much more um, flexible and um, you can adjust based on the partner partnerships that you need to need to align and make uh, make successful. So collaboration has been enormous. Um, you know, I've mentioned about our community health worker being at our public library system. Um, that is a, you know, government agency. But when we bring in the National Library of Medicine traveling exhibits, we are partnering not only with um, 
our city of Sioux Falls public health department for a display. We co-host the exhibit. We don't just have it at our office. We have multiple places that we partner with and that includes um, school districts. So some of the exhibits that we've had in already, we have had um, at a K through 12 school system and some have gone to a middle school only. We also have a senior center. So, and they just open up two locations, another new location. So now that goes to half of the week goes to one location. And then the other half of the week, it goes to the other location, which is on the far side of, of town. So, um, so those seniors get to have it. And then we also have it at our school of medicine. Um, and they're very excited. One of the doctors just um, commented last week when we had the we have the AIDS posters um, exhibit right now that we're just wrapping up. And um, he commented, these are so amazing. I am so excited that you bring these in um, or you're hosting them and sharing the hosting. So we are also um, located directly adjacent to a senior living apartment complex. Um, that's where our office is. And so those residents have the ability also to just come over and see the exhibits. And um, we have one resident who came yesterday and said, can you get one on the Revolutionary War? And, and what about this one? And I'm like, I don't actually create the exhibits, but we can. you can look through their website and see if you see it. Maybe we can put a, a bid out on it to see if we can get it here in the community. So, okay. Um, I think those are the facets, you know, of course I share with them all about um, the National Library of Medicine and the wonderful things that we did. And, you know, being a medical cataloger, that was that was my first start. So whenever I see mesh headings, I always have a little tear in my eye. So, um, and all right, I will just zip through this because you guys don't need to see that. Oh, we got somebody else waiting to get in. There we go. I guess I don't have our website, so let me um, put that in the in the uh, chat box in the chat area, so you can reach out. And I think Lauren said that questions were coming in a little bit, so yeah, I'll just oh, put so our. I put your uh, website in the chat already. Oh, perfect! Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Perfect, awesome. All right, well, I think that's. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Fran. You're welcome. We're so we're on to our last group of presenters. I'm going to introduce uh, Miranda Marquettes. Miranda is an assistant research professor with the Center for American Indian and Rural Health Equity at Montana State University, where she is a member of the Community Engagement Corps and research faculty. Miranda also has a research affiliate position with the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at Yale University. She is currently involved in several national institutes of health funded research projects related to women's reproductive health care and cancer prevention. She received her PhD Ooh. from Montana State University, LLM from Australian National University, and LLB from the University of Queensland. And her co-presenter is Alyssa Grimshaw, who will be coming up right after. Alyssa is the Clinical Research and Education Librarian at Yale University's Cushing Whitney Medical Library. She received her MS in Library and Information Science from Drexel University. MBA in Healthcare Management from Southern New Hampshire University, Advanced Postgraduate Certificate in Interprofessional Informationist from Simmons University, and is currently an MPH candidate at Dartmouth. Busy ladies. So take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Um, and thank you. Thanks, Lauren. And also thank you to Robin and Fran. They're um, wonderful examples that you're able to share and you're very hard acts to follow. Um, but yeah, we'd also like to say thanks to the whole team at Region 4 at the NNLM and particularly George Strawley and John Bramble, who have helped us with their support over the last couple of years. We've really appreciated the funding we've been able to receive and what we've been able to do and we're still doing as a result of this partnership. Um, so as Lauren said, my name is Miranda Margetts and I work with the Centre for American Indian and Rural Health Equity at MSU. And I actually first learned about the NNLM through a different project that I had a small role in, which was working with tribal college librarians. But I obviously learned about these engagement and outreach awards through that work. 
um, as Lauren said before, becoming involved in research, I worked in uh, health, legal and policy roles back in Australia, always usually with a focus on rural and women's health. Uh, I don't have a clinical background at all, but I have always found the legal and policy side of health things very interesting. And I realize everyone here obviously does as well. So today I'm presenting with Alyssa and I've been fortunate to collaborate with Alyssa for several years now. And the focus of my presentation will be to tell you how we've partnered with NNLM to reach women with malaria anomalies. And Alyssa is going to share her insights on her role as an information specialist and how that's helped with our goals to reach this community as well. Um, although it's just Alyssa and I talking today, I did want to share this quick slide so you can see the whole team that's been working on this. Um, I work with Bethany McCarter and also Nicole Holt, who are at Montana State. And uh, Dr. Alavash Mangita has been a key collaborator of mine. I've known her for six years. Um, and through her, I was introduced to Alyssa. Uh, as you can see, Ala is the head of pediatric and adolescent gynecology at Yale. And she also has a particular um, strong interest in this, in um, serving patients with these conditions. So what are malarian anomalies? I'm not sure if any of you have heard of them before, but they're congenital, which means something that you're born with, anomalies of the female reproductive tract. This um, image you can see on my on the right are examples of the different types of variations that can occur. Uh, the uterus is usually pear-shaped and the inner cavity is triangle-shaped, but for some women, the uterus as well as the cervix is shaped irregularly or is completely missing because of these malarian anomalies. They occur when the malarian ducts, which are a critical component of the development of the reproductive system, develop abnormally and they can disrupt the entire reproductive system, including the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the cervix, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina. So common symptoms that are often associated with uh, these anomalies are um, pelvic pain, preterm labor, infertility, recurrent miscarriages, and difficulty with tampon use or intercourse. And often the symptoms will depend on the type of anomaly. They're found, although it says here that they're rare, they're actually found in 7% of the general female population. And with the introduction, obviously, of more imaging and scanning that occurs, this number's creeping up. Um, and it actually increases to 25% of women who have experienced both miscarriage and infertility. Um, the types of variations, as you can see here, range from having no uterus, which is the most severe form, to having a double uterus and then various uh, variations in between. They're often diagnosed in adolescence when a young girl might have issues related to the onset of or absent periods. Uh, again, through adulthood, when a woman might be trying to conceive or carry a pregnancy and experiences complications with that. And also completely in incidentally, when it's discovered via a different health condition that the woman might be having treatment for. And it's this vast variety of ways that they can present, which um, cause them to be particularly complicated to identify. Um, I'll just admit her. And also why it can delay for many, many years the delivery of appropriate treatment. Um, so... I know we're here today because we're talking about serving um, more underserved populations and women with malaria anomalies are considered a sexual and gender minority population per the National Institutes of Health because MAs fall within the category of a difference of sex development. So it's really this main, main point that the reproductive development for these women differ from physiological norms that differ differentiates this population and places them within this population. Um, while they're obviously already recognised as a health disparity population, our team has um, been aware for some time that additional obstacles to healthcare faced by this population, such as health information challenges, can obviously further exacerbate these disparities and should, of course, be attempted to address, be addressed. Um, and we've been working for a number of years on translational, like clinical translational research inquiries to ultimately improve the clinical outcomes for this population, 
but it's only been through the funding from the NNLM and this partnership that we've really had the ability to focus on health information challenges and have been able to undertake this very complementary and what we think is very necessary and important focus on outreach and engagement. Uh, I thought I would just um, mention the specific funding opportunities we've been fortunate to receive from the NNLM, which really have brought um, our ideas to life. I've listed um, each of them here. And the first one that we received was focused on identifying health information gaps. And it compri comprised conducting a large audit of the suitability of online health information, specifically in Region 4, where there's obviously a greater number of rural uh, women. To, and we chose to pursue this because previous work our team had conducted with a population highlighted that a majority used the internet, not their healthcare providers, to obtain information about their diagnosis. And there was a vast range of understanding and satisfaction when it came to the type of information that, 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 he, that they had received about their diagnosis. And so the results of that audit were extremely revealing. And we also conducted a HEMAT, the Health Education Material Assessment Tool Analysis of that information. And we found that, and Alyssa was key in conducting that audit for us. Um, and we found that approximately 75% of all of that material we found failed the HEMAT test. And in addition to that, um, we tested that material using a flesh Kincaid calculator, which shows the reading grade level required to comprehend the material. And of all the information that uh, we found, over 90% required a college level education as well. Um, so that they were the results of that grant, which informed our opportunity, our um, insights into what we needed to do next and that's what we're currently in the middle of and that's the development of health education materials for women with malaria anomalies. Um, this focuses on including patients in the diagnosis, uh, including patients that have the diagnosis in the refinement of the frequently asked questions that we're developing and also including experts in the um, diagnosis to provide their insights as well. Um, we feel that we're only scratching the surface of this work, um, but it really is such a meaningful way to engage in outreach with such a um, small subset of this community. But we definitely have plans to broaden this in future work. And the group of patients that we're working with um, are patients that we've had previous experience with in a research capacity who have all almost at the level of 100%, um, put their hands up to be involved in any type of work that can improve health outcomes for people with this diagnosis. Um, and as I said, in future steps, we really want to take this FAQ development and have it validated by a much larger sample size from the community and then turn these into both patient and provider-focused um, materials. And noting the significant barriers to access that obviously exist out there for suitable information, we're focused on ensuring these are as patient-friendly as possible. Um, I hope I'm not going too much over time, but um, this, I think, is the, the crux of why we're here today and the NLM wanted us to speak, which is to discuss how we've actually reached the population. And as, as Robin and Fran referred to, um, I think to bring life to anything, you need to have people who actually want to do it. And we've been fortunate to have worked with both providers and patients who have a real passion for this topic and individuals responsible for reviewing and allocating funding to have also wanted to support it. So again, we're very thankful to NNLM for this. And core members of our team have been doing this work in our own time for a long time, um, but it's wonderful to start receiving funding to support it. And obviously, you know, we'd obviously like to get more and we're angling towards that through a variety of different outlets. Um, but in addition to that, uh, what I think really applies to the ability to reach any community is that we've strongly relied on our team members' connections to their networks of patients, either at their institutions or via collaborators that have been established through the formal research projects. So we have partnerships that extend through our collaborators across Yale University, the University of Utah, Indiana University, Billings Clinic, and even as far as 
with patients and providers in Europe and Australia. And I'm sure, as many of you might know, to ensure ethical compliance with the IRB policies to reach these patients, we need to partner with their physicians caring for them. So that's really how we've established a really um, the strong network of patients at this stage. Um, and I think another thing about that if, when trying to engage with patients is that having very um, credible long-term trusted providers is key as well because obviously there's that element um, that if the physicians are introducing them to the work, then it helps that they have a good relationship with their physician as well. Um, and I've also listed on the screen here um, media and online support groups. And we have also been fortunate to reach the population or have been lucky to have members of this population reach out to us as a result of visiting websites um, that has referred to our work and where they've been able to read online publications or news articles about our work. And they've reached out to us wanting to sort of know how they can be involved. And that's just wonderful when we have that happen. Um, and something we're delving further into as a result of the audit we undertook last year is learning more about the patient support groups that are out there catering to women that have the different varieties of these different anomalies. And some of the groups number in the thousands. And we know um, that an interesting topic for consideration is what type of information they're learning from each other and from which sources uh, of health information are they getting their um, insights from to share with each other so that's something that hasn't really been looked at and we're very interested in that um, and I've also noticed this final point is that um, these awards have really helped us reach out to this group to hear from the women so they can prioritize we can prioritize their needs so it's obviously about what they think is the most important thing to be focused on um, not what we think and as a result, so we can prioritise their needs for our for our work. Um, and also with something else I just want to mention was that um, I think all of everyone on our team could talk for a long time about this topic. We all have such a passion for it, but we're also aware that there are so many other women's gynecological health conditions that require more attention and engagement with the community of women experience them. Uh, but for now, we're obviously focused on this and fortunate to have NNLM support to do so. Um, and I just popped this on here as well. I wanted to share what we thought was the value of the NNLM partnership for this. Uh, obviously, knowing that it's funded by a well-regarded organisation such as the NNLM helps with credibility. People that we've worked with have really enjoyed the fact that there's been a regional focus um, through the awards our team has appreciated having the, the time and support to um, focus on this engagement and outreach and health information, health literacy aspect, as opposed just to the clinical outcomes, which are often where the funding dollars come through from. Um, we know that it's already revealing in, insights regarding health information challenges for the group. Um, and we've also really appreciated the encouragement and support for our multidisciplinary team as well that we've had from NNLM. And yeah, I will can also pop this in the chat, but that's my email address. And if anyone on the call here is interested in this or you think you might have friends or colleagues that um, would be interested to learn more about our work or be involved, you're very welcome to get in touch. And yeah, thank you everyone for your time today. And Alyssa is gonna um, take over from here. So I'll stop sharing for now. Hi, everyone. Um, so I know we have an interdisciplinary group of researchers, clinicians, and librarians on the call. Um, so I wanted to highlight in my part of the talk uh, the advantages of one, having a librarian on your um, engagement and outreach award, and then also the benefits to be a librarian on one of these awards. Um, so we're a little um, behind schedule. So I'm going to skip over the more obvious ones like advanced searching skills, research identification, organizational skills. And I'll move on to the um, maybe the skills that 
people don't recognize as traditional librarian um, things that we bring to the table. So um, I think that we're really methodology experts. And so we can bring so much more than just um, experts in methodology for review types. Um, as uh, Miranda was talking about, in our second year of the funding, we're doing a Delphi study uh, with both patients and providers, and I was uh, an in integral part of this process um, in, dis in establishing the methodology that we would be taking um, and discussing with the teams the typical way that these, uh, uh, these projects work um, and how to get consensus and all of that great information. So it's really important to think of your um, information professional as a um, potential methodology expert to help you um, with you know, whatever type of project you're undertaking. Um, and then I think that the other really great aspect of this project is our interdisciplinary collaboration between the team. Um, so we're all working really great together and, and doing different perspectives. And we have so many sub side projects that have come off of this grant uh, that definitely probably never would have happened if uh, we weren't, you know, together working on this project. Um, so that's really exciting that it's not only just impacting uh, the outputs that we have promised to the NNLM Region 4, but we're also doing other things, um, which is really great. Um, and we've also, because we have such an interdisciplinary um, team, we have presented this information really far and wide. So we've done it at uh, public health conferences, we have done it at library conferences, we're presenting at a medical conference in April. Um, so we're really getting awareness to all of the stakeholders um, that potentially might be interested in this information uh, when we do have an FAQ to disseminate. Um, and so that that's really great. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I always like to plug like librarians will save you time and we make the workflow way more efficient. So definitely, if you're thinking about um, applying for an NNLM engagement and outreach grant, reach out to your information pro professional um, to see if uh, a partnership or a collaboration uh, is, is possible. Oops. All right. Um, so, you know, reaping the rewards, right? Uh, I know as information professionals or the information professionals on the call, we're all busy. We're balancing multiple um, responsibilities and we have way too many people and we can't say yes to everyone, right? But I feel like this was such a great learning experience for me. And um, I definitely wouldn't recommend anyone shy away from the uh, opportunity to work with the NNLM on one of their research uh, an engagement grant, uh, sorry, engagement and outreach grants. Um, so first, I think, uh, you know, it's gaining a very different perspective than what maybe we see in our everyday practice. So I'm a clinical academic systematic review librarian. And so I don't often work with patient education information. And like, I can spout out all of the best practices, where to look for patient care information. But typically, I send the trainees or the doctors that I'm working with to go retrieve that information uh, for the patient so that they can look at it and evaluate it. Um, but, you know, even in the testing of, uh, you know, the reading calculator, I have a much better understanding now of what exactly makes this information at the appropriate reading level and how difficult it is to write information at that level. Um, and so, you know, understanding all of this information and just having a better awareness, um, and particularly like, you know, knowing what Medline plus is versus uh, WebMD and the quality between the two of them. And, and so you actually dig in deep and look at everything, um, you know, yourself, you don't actually know, you, you just know what, what's recommended um, in our field. Uh, and on top of that, I would say I definitely learned a lot of new skills. Um, so, you know, Delphi studies, right? Not many librarians can probably say that they've done a Delphi study, but I was able to take that firsthand knowledge and then be able to implement it um, in the second year part of our grant. Um, and I think that this has really helped me kind of gain street cred with all of my um, researchers here at Yale. So a lot of times I can talk the talk a little bit more and then I have a, a way more nuance in my response when they're trying to implement this information itself. So it has definitely been, uh, helps me be a better methodologist. Um, and then I think that the most important part of this process is that it strengthens our relationship with our researchers. So for me, this is twofold. Like I said, me and Miranda and the group are now working on a lot of different projects um, that potentially we wouldn't have uh, if we weren't working on this. But I also have had consultations where I brought up, hey, um, NLM has this really, NNLM has this really great grant. Maybe you would want to apply for it. This is the research cycle. This is uh, the the 
URL for you to look at all this information. And so I actually have another team that's considering applying for one in Region 7, and they're looking at it um, because they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do the project that they're considering because they don't have funding. And, and if they apply, that that would be great. So having the ability to you know recommend something, one, like they were really happy that I was able to give them a recommendation they've never heard of. But also, um, I've been through the process now, and I have an understanding of, uh, of what's being looked for, and I can help them with their application. Um, so it's been really great. I have so much more insight than I had before. So I definitely recommend any librarian uh, if you want to embed yourself on one of the teams that are applying for a grant. It's a it's a great experience. Um, and then I also included our contact information here. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about um, any research relating to this or any questions that you may have about our project or our methodology. Um, and then so we didn't get really big into the details of our um, our information here, but we did present a 45 minute or an hour long talk back in September. So I definitely recommend that if this spiked your interest that you check that out too. I will stop sharing now. Thank you all. <clears throat> I wanna give a big thank you to Miranda, Alyssa, Fran, and Robin for taking the time to present here. Um, we reserve some time for some questions. So if you have any, go ahead. You can either unmute yourself. You can pop it in the chat. Um, it's up to you. We all, I know we have a, just a couple of minutes because we got a little bit of a late start. Um, while folks, if, if you're thinking of questions, I did want to ask any of our presenters, um, not just Miranda and Alyssa, um, what would be your biggest tip or suggestion for folks thinking about applying for an NNLM grant? I'm happy to jump in. Go for it. Um, I, I found the ability to speak with George and John and run the ideas we had. As Alyssa said, we've, we've got so many different offshoots of interest areas with this population and um, being able to figure out how we can do something that's both within scope and meaningful um, was was very key. So I would say reach out to your the equivalents in the different regions of the John and the George, et cetera. Thank you. I was I was just gonna add about building relationships. Um, you know, if you're not successful the first time, learn from that proposal and you know, ask questions, make modifications based on um, feedback that you get have other eyes review it that are not um, involved in potentially your um, area of expertise uh, because reviewers sometimes don't have, uh, I'm gonna be, this word will sound blunt, but they don't have a clue um, sometimes on what you're doing. And so you you have to play to the, re the review process as well. Um, Brent, do you, I, go I ahead, would Brent. Just add one little thing. Um, Applying for a grant with an important organization like NNLM there can, can be intimidating because maybe my program or maybe my proposal is too modest and it doesn't qualify. But in listening to the breadth of all of our presenters today and knowing a little bit more of what kinds of things are possible with the help of the, of the team, and that would be for me, George and John, and David Brown, they want you to succeed with these grant applications. And in my little world, it's very modest. I mean, we're very low tech and just, you know, being with people and helping them find literature that helps them approach health in a better way. Don't be intimidated. Go for it and let, let those teams walk you through it and they definitely will make it easier. Great advice. I love some of the words that Robin just used. Yeah, don't be intimidated. You know, you learn from mistakes just like we do in life. And librarians are humble. You know, we we are very pacifistic, pacifists uh, when it comes to spreading our accolades. But I've learned because I'm in the community and, you know, competing with other nonprofit organizations for those those funds, those monies, just like uh, Miranda does in the academic world um, and Alyssa. So it you, you can't be timid you know, and you have to build relationships. Grant 
grantors want people to be working together. They want their money to be efficiently used. So don't be shy. Good advice. Um, if I don't see any other questions, I'll just ask one more. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge of your funded project? And I know you kind of touched, each of you touched on it a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more. Who wants to take that one? I will share mine. It's just spending hours away from your family and other activities that you love in life because you're devoted <laughs> to getting that grant and then it is rejected. So you just move on just like life and start writing the next one. Um, I think I have a, a, a totally different mindset when it comes to impediments to success. One of which in my idea is being able to provide appropriate evaluative materials. When we're dealing with human beings and we're not allowed to use, um, oh, I know that there are certain restrictions like we can't use um, individual people, we can't use testimonials for our evidentiary results. Uh, trying to build a grant that has a measurable outcome with a successful means for achieving that in a statistical way. You know, I'm just a little mouse in a hole and it can be very hard to put that into, into practice. That, that's a trick. That one is a trick. I would agree with Robin and Fran on both of those points. We, yeah, very used to applying for things and being rejected, but you'd have to take what you can from it and learn and go back again. And also with evaluation, that's hard as well, not just for an NLM, but for all types of funded work when you know you've had a real impact just maybe on not a, as big a sample size as someone would like to see or um, things like that. So I understand that. Um, and I'm I'm interested in Alyssa's thoughts on this, but when you are fortunate to receive the funding that we have, um, I think you're not necessarily sure exactly what you're going to find. And we've found that there's just been so much more work that has developed as a result of these small grants. So it's how do you keep, um, like as Fran alluded to, how do you like not spend too much time on something, but do what's most important? So how do you really keep the scope sufficiently narrow to get great results? But Alyssa, yeah, what do you think? Like the audit that was just huge and um, so much work has come out of that, but it was a good thing, but it was also a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that that's a uh, problem in librarianship in general. We just have so many opportunities for involvement that, um, you know, it's really hard to know what you should say yes to and what you should back off to keep everything narrow and achievable. Because if you take on too much, you don't finish anything. Um, I, I, so I definitely think that is definitely a, a big challenge. Um, and then also like uh, wanting to do things that are like best practice. Like I wanna publish something based on what we have found in our in our environmental scan, but I wanna publish it open access. So it's available to all of the patients um, if they wanted to read that and so that they had that information and those findings, um, but it's so expensive. So finding that and then finding funding for that. And it's like every single time you get a little bit of funding then in, in, after you you do that one project, then you need more. And it's just a, a constant rolling battle of trying to um, get the appropriate things needed to uh, you know, publish all of this and, and do the work. That's the disparity that, that we have um, in my role and I'm sure in Robin's, we're just hoping that we can get a coat on somebody who's walking the streets or the reservation. Um, so having been in academia, I, I understand the need for publishing. And I, I'm David has been amazing and John for, you know, getting me to talk, but I'm more I'm more geared towards those, you know, daily needs. Do they have food? Do they, you know, do they have a place to sleep that's not under a bridge, that sort of thing. So, um, and build relationships. That's the key. Don't be, don't be a. Um, you have to, you have to not be. 
you got to you can't think narrow you have got to think broad and think of all the possibility par possible partners right i think we are at time um, i want to thank all of our speakers again thank you for uh dealing with our little technical hiccup but we got it figured out um i'm gonna stop recording but thank you again and thank you all for coming to our region for a talk and if you have any questions you always can email us or any of the presenters um, our email, I'm going to pop it in the chat. It's just region4 at nnlm.gov. All right. Have a great afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Take care, everyone.